Hello all, Green Abundance by Design here again at the Edwards Church Edible Forest Garden, I guess technically the Open Spirit Edible Forest Garden, located at Edwards Church in Framingham, Mass. So I just want to give you a quick walkthrough as to uh, what we have going on here. Uh, so far this has been a uh, two season plant out. Uh, we broke it down into different phases. Phase one was last season, 2016, spring. Uh, and this year has been uh, filling out the majority of the remaining sections of the garden in phase two. That has been the spring and uh, now early summer of 2017. So, to begin, here is our entrance here. And uh, you're greeted by uh, the beginnings of the meadow native meadow ecology. So over here we have a variety of different native wildflowers and there's uh, Sclepius tuberosa, uh, some solidago, I believe some penstemon, maybe not, nope. Uh, the yellow flower that you see there that's a lance, a lance leaf coreopsis, coreopsis lancelata. And then you have some picanthemo in the back there, uh, virginianum, so Virginia mountain mint. And over here we have some columbine, aquilegia, canadensis, along with some more picanthemum, some penstemon digitalis. And then moving on, we have our, the beginnings of our edible section of the edible forest garden. So what you see here is a service berry. It is a uh, emelancier lavis, which will be a uh, multi-stemmed shrub getting to about I'd say around 10 feet or so a little higher if we let it go uh, in front here we have a some low bush blueberry we got four in here down there as well and next to the service berry we have a New Jersey tea shrub and that is primarily for its nitrogen fixing abilities so we're looking to maintain the fertility of the garden from within the garden and continuing down here, we have another amelance here. This time it's a Allen folia, which is technically not a native to Massachusetts. I um, believe its native region is more north in Canada, but still within the same family of the amelance here, which for the most part are native to the northeast. And next to that, we have a black chokeberry or an aronia. Melancarpia, I believe that's the uh, species name. Two of those right next to each other with a third in the back there. Another New Jersey tea shrub right there. More low bush blueberries. And our final service berry. Uh, the variety of that amelance here, Alnifolia, Alnifolia, is a regent. It stays fairly short at about five feet. So this all will be a fairly short edible hedge. And this is along the main pathway going into the Edwards Hall there, which uh, is a multi-use space with a variety of different groups using it. Yoga, the Vet Center, all sorts of community groups work out of there. So like I said again, this is the meadow over here, and we continue down into this path here into another section. And this is a partially meadow right in here. We have our meadow ecology. And in all these meadow paths we have, or uh, meadow beds, we have native grasses as well growing. Uh, we started these from seed, though that's not ideal in the sense of establishing uh, your meadow fairly quickly and not having as much weeding issues. Uh, our budget didn't really allow for affording transplanted grass. So this is all started from seed and this is little blue stem and side oats grandma. We're seeing how those go. And that is in an effort to kind of break up the uh, flowers so it's not just clumps of flowers. We're looking to kind of create a, a somewhat more naturalized um, meadow instead of just a straight flower garden. Down here again we have some more service berries. These are the Regent again, the shorter of the variety. Another New Jersey tea shrub again for nitrogen fixing. Also it's a nice flower. 
Uh, just put this in today. This is a uh, grape, seedless grape. Uh, it's a yellow sweet grape. And the idea is we're going to train it along this rock wall eventually. Hopefully it'll grow up to that banister over there. And it'll be trained along the front facade of that rock wall there. So filling out all spaces that we can with edible opportunities. Yeah, moving on to this path and what you see here on the right, this was phase one here along with what's down there. So we put this in in 2016. Here again we have another amylance here. I believe that's another lavis. And uh, the nice thing about the amylanceers as an edible uh, shrub slash tree, short tree, is that uh, they really uh, require very little maintenance. The only thing that I've noticed is that uh, the two years that we've had it have been uh, it has been fed upon by the gypsy moth and uh, winter moth. So that's the that's the main source of its damage. Otherwise, uh, it's been a fairly easy easy plant here. Um, due to those gypsy moth and uh, winter moth, we've only been able to harvest a few berries off of them. Um, and likely the birds also got on the birds generally love them. But this is a pretty uh, pretty great fruit. Uh, has a very mild sweetness to it. Some would say very blueberry-like. Um, but what's really interesting about it is the seed inside has this almondy flavor. So it makes a very interesting, nice berry there. And uh, along in here we have a ground cover going. This is Fragaria vesca, which is woodland strawberry. Now, this was established as a ground cover, an edible ground cover. Um, in here we planted, I think it was about eight or so plants last year along the front edge. And it's kind of done its job here. It's almost taken over the entire bed as a ground cover. So initially this was mulched with wood chips and planted in. We did a sheet mulching effect because the soil here was fairly low in nutrients and very acidic. So we added about three, four inches of compost on top of that. We put some cardboard down in between the existing soil and that new compost and then we layered wood chips on top of that new compost. So so far the results for this this bed has been uh, very successful. Uh, you can see here's a good example of the berry off of these. Very sweet. <clears throat> I find it much sweeter than a traditional garden cultivated strawberry. Um, and the benefit with these is that uh, so far I haven't noticed any any animals enjoying these. I know with my own gardens the, uh, the garden strawberries tend to get picked pretty heavily by chipmunks, at least in my garden. So this has been, while not being as big as your traditional garden strawberry, I have actually been able to harvest them and they are quite enjoyable. Um, today we're getting a lot of wildlife around. I don't know if you can't see, but there's a dragonfly that's been buzzing around here. Very enjoyable experience seeing these guys do their thing. And so, uh, another New Jersey tea shrub. And here we have uh, Coreopsis verticillata, a thread leaf or tick seed Coreopsis. Uh, this is an awesome, awesome native plant. I uh, love the flowers, very showy, prolific. Holds its uh, flowers for a good amount of time and uh, just really has a beautiful, very fine leaf. So it almost has that fern like quality where you have like this softness to it based on the, the fact of how many. The frequency of leaves that are there. And the beginning here you see also uh, yarrow, Achillea millenfolia, millenfolium, something like that. Uh, this was generously donated by uh, Melanie, the uh, farm manager over at Stern's Farm. She grew these as cut flowers in 
the way they have their management practices, they uh, remove all their flowers at the end of the season. And this being a perennial, uh, I very excitedly transplanted as much as I could out of there and put a lot, quite a bit in uh, in this garden here. You can kind of see it peppered throughout this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so down at the end. Moving on, we got the more of the woodland strawberry. This was also part of phase one. This was kind of like a little island that we then built off of for phase two. More Coreopsis, you can see it's a bevy of activity here. Pollinators. Another interesting thing about these is that they uh, attract beneficial insects as well, parasitic wasps or parasitoid wasps that we uh, want in our garden so that they help uh, control pest problems. Um, yeah, the yarrow here too is being quite enjoyed by these, these guys. I don't know if you can see that guy. Oh. I got a parasitoid wasp, parasitic wasp on uh, my phone here, which you can't see. He looks kind of awesome. Yeah, he's right on the phone. Well, I guess he'll continue our tour with us. Also in here, which is kind of hard to see with all the strawberry, but we did plant some low bush blueberries in the front here. It's kind of hard to see. It's in the middle of the strawberries, and I have to kind of mulch those back a bit so they have some more room to grow. So we got one, two, three, and then we have a half high uh, blueberry right there. And again, along with the service berries, the blueberries have been hit pretty heavily by the uh, various moths in the spring. So we've had a little bit of a setback in terms of their growth for them, but uh, this one seems to have recovered fairly nicely. Um, Oh yeah, and here we have uh, another ground cover that's just past its flower. You can kind of see uh, its leaves in here. This is a uh, common name would be green and gold. Um, it's a fairly uh, shade tolerant ground cover that has a really beautiful flower to it, which you can see actually right there. And that's kind of a early spring or so flower breaks up the uh, garden nicely and I hope to plant some more of that around here uh, forgive me but I forget the Latin name for it uh, begins with a C of something so again here we continue the uh, phase one more yarrow and I have to thin this out a bit uh, mirroring our steps we have another half high blueberry another low bush blueberry another low bush blueberry that's been overtaken by this yarrow uh, and then our high bush blueberries along the back here. We have one, two, three, four. And so they're plant, planted fairly far apart. And then the uh, idea that in you know, 10 years or so, these will be pretty close to touching. So uh, definitely planning for the longer term. Uh, I still haven't decided about adding more blueberries potentially staggered or offset from each other to try to get more in here. Um, certainly I plan on adding some more low bush blueberries in the front here along with some permanent stepping stones so that we can not be so concerned about stepping on the strawberries and having a place to step into the garden and harvest the blueberries. We have a blueberry that actually I planted this year in replacement of a blueberry that got fairly hit by uh, winter moth the first season. So this one is doing nicely. It's fruiting well. The birds will likely get that. Good for them. More yarrow. More woodland strawberry. Yarrow. I did plant some asparagus along the back there this year. We'll see if those come up and how they do. Uh, and here again we have another service berry. Amelancier canadensis, I believe is the variety of this one. Um, part of the reason why we planted these service berries is that this was one of the New England natives that would tolerate the very acidic soil that we have present here. Uh, the pH of this 
the existing soil here is about 5.1, which is very acidic, which is in part influencing the decision behind the blueberries. So everything here has generally been selected for its uh, acid tolerating properties, uh, at least in the woody species. For the most part, they're herbaceous stuff. Um, some of it can dip into the acidic, but generally prefers more neutral pH. Um, but again, because we added that three to four inches of compost on top, the strawberries and other things at least have a, a good source of more pH neutral soil to uh, feed from. Uh, and then up here again we have an extension of this little island that we put in last year and this is another meadow ecology here. Uh, more Asclepius tuberosa the, along the front. More Picanthemum mountain mint. And uh, we introduced here some Rudbeckia sweet black-eyed Susan which is the more perennial variety instead of the biennial nature of the regular black-eyed Susan. And uh, yeah, more Picanthemum, uh, more Penstemon digitalis along in here. And you can see the irrigation here. So we have Netifem running through all the beds. Uh, the beds along the front side of the building are all drip along with this one and those two little islands that you saw. And then these have a micro spray overhead irrigation. So we're just basically irrigating these little patches but from above and this is for uh, the purpose of, well, uh, it's easier to install and also we're starting grass seed in here. Again those native grasses so we're looking to have a moist uh, topsoil layer like the first half inch there we want to try to keep moist for uh, their establishment. Moving along here we installed this raspberry uh, bed here and part of the issues with the site is that this whole parking lot all the snow gets plowed over into this area so actually down to about here is where the runoff from that snow is which pretty much prevented us from planting of anything of a woody uh, woody nature um, so the reason why we did the raspberries is that we could cut these down to the soil every every year so that when it came time for plowing we wouldn't be uh, ruining our patch here. And these are specifically fall bearing straw, or, uh, raspberries for that reason. Uh, they're a red raspberry. So yeah, every year we'll let it grow, harvest it in the fall, and then cut the canes back down to the ground so we could start over again next year. And what you'll see here, all of these beds, the leading edge of it, the uphill edge of it, is on contour. So all these beds here are level at the same point. And this was done in effect to passively harvest as much rainwater as possible. As you can see, there's a lot of runoff coming, coming or possible from the street, so or from the parking lot. So we're looking to harvest as much rainwater as possible. So in the uh, longer term prospects for the garden, we're not having to irrigate. The uh, intention for this irrigation is for it to be temporary within the first couple of years of its establishment. And once everything's rooted, that uh, it won't be uh, necessary to water. And uh, you see some more Coreopsis, Lancelotta here. And then you have Ohio spiderwort. Forgive me, I forget the uh, Latin name again. Is there a tag here? Tradescantia ohioensis. And the majority of these plants were uh, purchased from Prairie Moon Nursery out in Minnesota. Everything arrived uh, in good shape and everything is done uh, very well. And some more Solidago, some more Black-Eyed Susan. The variety of Solidago that we got is the showy goldenrod, Speciosa. So yeah, here, here we have it. And the uh, you know overall principles of an edible forest garden um, 
are that we're looking to mimic forest ecosystems while planting that forest out with as much edible, medicinal um, plants as possible. And that includes the flowers, which are for the bees, birds, butterflies, which help make our garden healthy with uh, its biodiversity. So yep, here we are year two, summer 2017. Um, probably only have about uh, one or two more plantings before I would say this is pretty, uh, pretty well where I want it to be. Um, I do want to put a ground cover in in that berry patch along the pathway. I think I'm going to do another planting of the strawberry, the woodland strawberry. And uh, yeah, we're just going to see it and let it grow. Oh, one thing that we are missing that I uh, do plan on putting in here, but again, time and money didn't allow for it this year, is uh, <clears throat> some Minarda fitulosa, the wild bergamot which uh, will kind of fit in here and over there in the meadow over there. Super, uh, super beneficial flower to butterflies, bees, native bees, um, all around excellent addition to uh, any garden. So yeah, I hope you enjoy, comment, like, share. Uh, be happy to hear your thoughts on, uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, please, uh, Put them down below. Thanks a lot. Green Abundance.